Hi guys, and welcome to week nine in our uh, Intro to Stats course. So in this section, we're gonna expand on your skill set from the last section of regression and talk about mediation and moderation, which are special types of regression. So we've already kind of talked about the, the things that we can ask with regression. Let's see what some other questions might be, starting with mediation. So mediation is a situation where you have a third wheel involved, right? So there's some relationship between our predictor and outcome, which is X and Y or independent variable and our dependent variable. And that relationship is somehow changed when we add a third variable to this situation. And really this is a test of kind of like correlated correlations. <laughs> But the idea here is that the addition of the mediator changes the relationship between X and Y. And specifically, what happens is it's not the predictor that predicts the outcome. It's this detour that we take through the mediator. So the predictor predicts the mediator, which then predicts the outcome. So we're going from path C here to instead saying, well, there's too much snow <laughs> in my situation right now, or there are the roads closed. So instead we have to take this detour and go around. And so this is based on a very famous paper of Baron and Kinney. And it's this idea that there are these steps, these particular components to mediation that one should test. And the first is that the outcome should predict uh, should be predicted by the predictor variable, which is sort of an odd way to say X should predict Y. Okay. Then we will use X to predict our mediator. Okay, this is called path A. Then we'll predict Y with both X and M and see what happens to the relationship between X and Y. Now, for a long time, um, the rules were you had to meet all four of these conditions the predictor must significantly predict the outcome variable. I have a star here for a reason, we'll come back to it. So X must predict Y, this is sometimes called the direct effect or path C. Okay. The predictor must significantly predict the mediator. So X must predict M, this is path A on our diagrams. The mediator must significantly predict the outcome variable while including X, so this is path B. And last but not least, the predictor variable must be less predictive <laughs> um, than originally. So path C prime should be less than C originally, closer to zero, whichever way is closer to zero. So if you have a negative C value, it must get closer to zero. So not literally less, it should predict at a smaller value. Now, there are some limitations to, to this model. Actually, let me talk with my star here first. So, um, you know, mediation is very popular, but um, a lot has changed since 86. <laughs> so many folks don't think that C actually has to be significant anymore, this first step, where X should probably only somewhat predict Y but we're more interested in the change when we add the M variable than we are, so the last step here, then we are making sure that first path is significant. Right? And we've talked all semester about the issues with significance. And so we're mostly interested in is the change when including M um, important. Now I get asked a lot about um, X predicting M, does X have to predict M? I, and it sort of depends on what your goal is, right? So we go back and look at this picture, right? Um, down here on the bottom. If your goal is to say that, um, that it's no longer direct, okay? This is total effect, this is direct effect. I may have said that wrong a second ago, but the total effect model and the direct effect model doesn't really those are confusing terms. So let's just call it C when there's nothing in the extra in the equation and C prime when it, there is um, the mediator in the equation. Um, so does the predictor have to predict the mediator? And I think that depends on if your 
your question is that instead of taking this direct path and instead takes this indirect path, we could do a detour. And if the part A isn't open, <laughs> then that detour is kind of hard to do. So I generally say that depends on your hypotheses, but most people don't define these hypotheses as clearly as they should. So um, what we're gonna say is that both A and B should be important. And we can define importance in a lot of ways. It could be significance or the effect size or the beta value. And there should be some change in C when M is added. All right. Now the limitations of this is how much does that relationship have to change between C and C prime for you to say this is mediated? For a long time, what people relied on was that the first pathway, path C, would be significant, P less than 0.05. And this sort of the, the second version of it, C prime with the mediator, would not be significant. Okay, and this would be a fully mediated model. And hopefully by this point in the semester, you've understood that significance is kind of a tricky thing because it depends a lot on sample size and some other, other factors, but maybe it doesn't mean important, right? And the sort of all or nothing thinking is problematic. And then for, for a time it was okay, well, as long as the value has gone down, but if they're both still significant, this is partially mediated, which is also a problematic term. And so Two solutions, one the Sobel test, which we'll talk about um, in a second, and bootstrapping, which is definitely the more popular option now, because with our computing abilities, we can do this rather easily. Before, maybe it wasn't so easy. Sobel test is just some math. Now bootstrapping is really um, fairly straightforward. So we can um, use that as our parameter, our, our estimation of whether or not this mediation has occurred. So the Sobel test is um, a way to think about, excuse me, whether or not the change in the C pathway is greater than zero. And so if the Sobel test is significant, this is a Z test, there you would say there's significant mediation. So we don't look at the p-values for the models anymore. We look at the p-values for the Sobel test. So we're still dealing in p's. And we're going to use the Aurorian Sobel version because it does not assume that the standard error of A and B uh, don't exist. <laughs> so there are several mm, different forms of math for Sobel. And this version is one of the more popular ones because it doesn't assume that the standard errors for our models are very, very small, which is a good thing. Now bootstrapping, what is bootstrapping? Okay. Well, it's a procedure where we take an analysis and we run it a bunch of times and then average that effect to create a confidence interval of around the average effect. And if you're thinking like, if you take the data, run the same analysis over and over again, you should get the same answer, excellent. That's the point of reproducibility. However, what we do is take our data and randomly select data points, rows from our data um, with replacement. Okay, so this would be like the lottery if we put the balls back. Okay, so we take a data point and we put it in our data set and we put it back. Then we take another data point and we put it back. So um, what happens is sometimes data points get selected because you're uh, multiple times because you're assuming that they're representative of the larger data set. So it's okay. You're representing the fact that there are three different people, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> One moment. It's like a weird catch in my throat. Okay. You're assuming that there are three different people who are all similar to the one data point. So it's okay if we use that data point three times, because in the real world that may represent, you know, these three people. And 
what what this does is that you create data sets of the same size so you aren't cheating by making your sample larger but it sort of represents kind of a pooled version of many different samples at once so you take that you calculate them all you get the average effect which should match your effect from your your um, regular data and you create a confidence interval around that effect based on running it many times rather than based on some statistical distribution. So remember our confidence intervals are normally about two times the standard error. This allows us to correct for um, maybe some weird standard errors or just making sure that we've, uh, we don't know necessarily what the distribution of an indirect effect is. I know what a distribution of T looks like, but what is this distribution of this indirect effect? I don't know. Is it normal? Who knows? It could be skewed. I don't know. So creating a bootstrapped confidence interval is more appropriate. Now you can use bootstrapping in a lot of places. And we talked about um, in the last lecture series, uh, if your assumptions for regression are maybe kind of a little like, woo, bootstrapping can help by providing uh, standard errors that uh, sort of deal with heteroscedasticity. So this is kind of like the lottery if they pull the balls from like the lottery, but they put the balls back. So you could get the same number multiple times. And so the final idea for mediation anyway, is if the confidence interval of that indirect effect, the mediation effect does not cross zero, that implies that mediation has occurred. Okay? Because the idea is that our confidence interval represents a range of true population values. And if zero is one of our true population values, then no mediation. But if zero is not one of our true population values, then maybe mediation. Okay? We have some evidence for mediation. So th thinking about data screening for this, because it requires us run several steps. One, I'm gonna show you a cool package that will do all this for you, woohoo, okay. But it, it, the models themselves occur in stages. We have X predicting Y, part one, X predicting M, part two, X and M predicting Y, part three. And so how do I screen or issues with that kind of model when there are actually three different models with different DVs going on. Well, I don't want to confuse this with hierarchical regression. So I call them stages just so that we're not calling them steps because it's not a hierarchical regression. It is um, three different models that we use to ask the question about mediation. And so what do I do data screening wise? Well, what I tend to tell people to do is run the, the largest model. Okay, the, just like in hierarchical regression, we run the last step. So we screen both the IV and the mediator at the same time, predicting the DV, because that's step three. Okay. And that will screen all three variables for us and give us all of our good outlier information. And so that way you're screening the final stage of the mediation model and getting all the variables at once. You can also use that fake regression procedure that we used way back in chapter five because it will do all the variables at once. But if you do that, you can't get cooks and leverage. So we are gonna keep using those because this is a regression analysis and we wanna make sure that we don't have people who are unduly influencing slopes. All right. So let's look at an example to make this more solid. And so the question is, does the use of Facebook mediate the relationship between previous knowledge and exam scores? So anytime you see a question like this, what you're going to say is, okay, does M mediate the relationship between X and Y? And so in this scenario, Facebook is our mediator. Previous knowledge is our X and exam scores is our Y. With the idea that if you're using Facebook too much, you aren't studying. <laughs> and so it may change that relationship. Well, although that was the original idea when I wrote these notes a million years ago, but maybe now it's because you're using Facebook and you're getting all the con all of the fake news 
that that previous knowledge <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. So, all right. <clears throat> so in these scenarios, it's very important that we don't have missing data because we want all of our models to be compared on the same data points. So we can't do pairwise deletion here. If someone is missing M, well, they would, they could, you could use them for X to Y, but then you couldn't use them for X to M or X to plus M to Y. So we want to make sure uh, uh, there's no missing data for our, in our data sets for this type of analysis for these variables anyway. All right, so let's look here. What we see <clears throat> is our three variables. Okay, I imported this as an SPSS file, but I don't really have to do a whole lot to it, right? Because none of these are categorical. So, you know, let's uh, get rid of this one missing data point, excuse me, by using NA omit. Okay. So now I have a complete data set that I can um, use for my data screening. Now, uh, the package I'm going to show you actually will do the data screening for you because yours truly wrote it <laughs> in the same way that I've taught you in class, which is really awesome. However, it does assume that you've already checked for accuracy and missing data. So it assumes that you've done these first two steps and it starts at outliers. So I'm going to show you how to run these by hand, so to speak, and then I'm going to show you the package because I think it's helpful to understand how one does these <clears throat> without any extra add-ons for when those add-ons break. So for example, I know there's some sort of weird wonky error going on in this package and I can't figure out exactly why it's happening. And so, you know, if that happens, you can at least go back and run it by, you know, one step at a time or one stage at a time. And that doesn't limit your ability to still calculate these analyses just because the package doesn't work. Okay. And so for this one, we're going to calculate the C pathway. Oop, okay. This is where X is predicting Y. Okay. So we've got exam is predicted by previous knowledge. Run a summary here. We'll go down. Is our overall model significant? Yeah. We're predicting about 5% of the variance. So this is probably somewhere between small and medium. But since we only have one predictor, the overall model question is the same thing as the is the predictor important question. So it's also significant. And so I just printed that out here. Now don't forget, we can use our APA print options too to make these um, print pretty nicely. I think I just typed this one out because I had it saved from before, but we could also use that print function we saw in the last lecture. So yeah, the C path is significant. Okay. I think this one's called the total effect model. Okay. And next up, we've got the A path okay, where X is predicting M. Okay, this is part of our indirect effect. And let's see here, we've got um, X previous is predicting Facebook. And this is a small effect, it's 2%, but our previous knowledge predicts our Facebook use, okay? And it's negative. So our previous knowledge, imp this implies that the more previous knowledge we have, the less we're looking at Facebook. All right, so. Now, the last stage where we put B and C in there, so we're going to have X and M together now predicting Y. And that B path, so let's look at it, previous plus Facebook tilde Y. Okay. Our overall model is 13 or 14% 14 of the variance, but we're really way more interested in these predictors. So part of the indirect path, we've got B here. And it's significant, it's negative. So Facebook use is negatively predicting our exam score. So the more we're using it, the less we get on our exam. Then our C prime path here, which is just lower than before. So let's go back and look at C here. Okay, so B is 0.32 and now B is 0.26. It's still significant, but it is closer to zero which is what we're interested in finding. 
And so that pathway suggests that our previous knowledge pre predicts our exam scores, which we would hope. And so now we have to decide if the change here, the 2.26 decrease is important. Okay. So all the other parts of mediation are sort of there. C is significant, A is significant, B is significant or important or however we want to think about that. Now, is that change important? Now, uh, just to kind of make sure all these summaries are, are here for you later, previous experience pro positively predicts our exam scores, that's C. Previous experience negatively impacts Facebook time, that's A. Controlling for previous experience, because these are both in the same equation at the same time, Facebook time negatively impacts exam scores. Um, remember, we can't compare these directly because they are unstandardized. And then controlling for Facebook scores, previous experience positively impacts exam scores still, but maybe it's less. And this is our sort of question. So should say change for 0.32 here, 0.32, 0.32. Well, I could run the Sobel test. And there are a bunch of packages that do mediation as well, but just to show you how kind of gross the Sobel test is, check out this formula. <laughs> and so it's always kind of confusing to people because the indirect effect is actually calculated as A times B. But that mathematically usually works out to the same thing as C prime my, or C minus C prime. So we're seeing how much there is a change in C by calculating the indirect path through A and B. And so it's always interesting because mediation is described as this change in C because it's going to A and B. And so the, the, the mediation effect is calculated as A times B. Um, and then it's a signal to noise ratio, which shouldn't be surprising, okay? So it's A times B over the standard error, but the standard error has like a, gross extreme. Okay. And so for many moons, I had a typo in these notes. And so actually using, um, using some packages, I was able to fix that. And so it works out to be this like kind of wonderfully beautiful mess here. B squared times the standard error for A squared. Okay. And I have it as SE. Um, it should also kind of be, it, it, we could treat it either way, but it is standard error here. Um, plus A squared times the standard error for B plus the standard error for A times the standard error for B. Kind of depends on which um, place you're looking at it for, but it, you should be using the standard error from your output. So if the indirect effect is larger than our error, if our signal is larger than our noise, we would conclude that the in, uh, addition of the mediator variable changed that C path by forcing it through instead A and B. So we would just fill in our numbers. And honestly, as long as you put your equations in the same sort of order that I did, then um, you won't need to change this code. So what the heck does that mean? Well, see here, I have co coefficient of model two, number two. Okay, remember the coef function just provides us the coefficients printed out. So let's go back over here and look at this code. Okay. So let's run summary model one, two, three, shwink. Okay. And if I run coef model two, one we're interested in for the A path is previous here. So that's why it has the square brackets too, is that pulls up just that one number. Okay. Co of model three, the one we're interested in is B. Okay. So the reason that we get the third one over is because the first one is C, the second one is B. Okay, minus C intercept. Okay. So we get our Facebook one. Okay. And those are the two that we want, because if you remember from the picture, we want the A path where predictor is, our predictor is um, predicting, wow, that's terrible, where our previous knowledge is predicting Facebook effects. Okay. 
And then our Facebook effects are predicting the outcome. And so as long as you put them in the same order, when you're doing your homework or whatever, right? So we say previous is predicted by exam. Oh, we're not using model one, sorry. Uh, model two here, previous predicts if Facebook. You can't get these wrong. We've done the wrong, um, the wrong analysis completely. But here, put C first and then put, put the X first and then the mediator second. And then this code will work just fine. Okay. All this math, it comes out to 1.94, which isn't significant. Okay. And so we would take to calculate that, that's the Z score to calculate our P value for the Z score. We take the absolute value of that Z score because we're going to do a two tail test okay. and do lower tail equals false. So this will give us the top because this is the cumulative probability. So if we tell it lower tail equals true, it's going to give us a big old number, which isn't what we want. So we say, okay, just tell me what percent that is at the top. And it's a two tail test. I don't know if you remember from the beginning of the semester, but 1.96 is the 0.05 cutoff. And so you can tell that we're calculating this correctly because it's just slightly over 0.05 because we haven't quite hit 1.96. So our car has stopped right short of the finish line, but it's still not significant. Okay, if we're going to use our cutoff rules of alpha of 0.05. Okay, what about this bootstrapping thing? Well, um, let me tell you a little bit about the bell test first. Sorry, I thought bootstrapping was next. So we say z equals 1.93, p equals 0.05. We would conclude that no mediation had occurred. The change from 0.32 to 0.26 is not important or significant. Okay. Now let me tell you about bootstrapping. So there's this package that I will one day go back to working on when I'm not recording all these videos that um, my friend decided to help me name. So it's called Mimo Boot R, okay, for mediation, moderation, bootstrapping in R. And this is taken from several ideas. There's a really popular plugin for SPSS. This is sort of based on, and it's just meant to help make this whole process kind of a one-stop shop with many lofty goals in mind one day. But it does do single mediation and single moderation pretty well. So we can use it for class. Now it does load a bunch of things for you. So it will make a, a triangle picture for you. Not a very good one, but it'll, it'll do it. And loads the boot library. Okay, the boot library is what does the bootstrapping. So you say mediation one because okay, I want um, one mediator, because we can actually do multiples. Okay. We can do up to like six parallel. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Stick with one or two, but you can do a bunch. So we say, okay, here's our Y and put this in quotes because it grabs that column from your data frame. So this needs to be the column name in the data frame. Use X here, use M okay. and what, what data frame it is. Okay. So I don't have to worry about getting them in the right order, running the steps in the right place, or grabbing the right coefficient. I just stick them all in. And it does the data screening like we do in class. So it'll print out your QQ plot on that last step. Ooh, we might be in some trouble here. Okay, this is simulated data, it's fake. I don't know that I simulated it very well, now did I? So this uh, linear any wise is a little questionable. And so we might consider trying non-parametric regression, which this currently does not do. This is one of the lofty goals. Is R is R R standardized residuals? Okay, how do those look? Well, it actually doesn't look too bad. Okay, we got a little bit of skew here, a little bit positive skew, but most of the data is actually centered over zero in between two and two. And then how does our diagram look here? Oh boy, runs from negative two to six. That is no good. Okay. Now the spread is fairly even. I've got this little bad boy out here, but it's not good that the there's this big discrepancy here. Okay. Well, and it does make me a cute picture. Okay. So I can see it in that sort of triangle shape. Everybody loves these triangle diagrams. Okay, and it prints the paths for you. So this is C and not C prime. Now, maybe it's because there are outliers in here because we haven't screened at all. Well, what's really cool 
um, is that the package actually will tell you in, again, the same format that we've taught in class, these outliers. So if you look um, at, excuse me, this is what we saved it as. It's saved as a list. You know, you know what? Show me the data screening step and show me the full data. It actually will put in here your um, bad Mahalanova score, your bad leverage, and your bad Cooks. So I could see if I had any outliers. So let's do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are, but I actually can't remember. So this does do bootstrapping. So it runs a bunch of samples for you. I think the default is a thousand. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so the number of bootstraps is automatically a thousand. You can actually change it. I just didn't show you that code. And let's see. So let's go view med results, dollar sign data screening, full data. Let's flip through here. Okay. So we do have several people we might consider outliers. And what we can do is rerun this analysis and there's actually a, a portion here where it says with underscore out, you could say false and it would exclude uh, two strikes you're out. Okay, it does have that rule. Or you could say, okay, I wanna take this data set and I'm making up my own rule, but I wanna make a new data set. And I'm gonna call it no out. I would just subset, so subset, oops, subset, no uh, total outliers less than two here. We're like, cool, cool, we got rid of all of them. And then I could just run my mediation again. I would just change this here to no out. Well, let's see what that looks like. Gonna okay, rerun this here in a minute change it back. So now let's see. Ooh, mm, yeah, still not totally linear. A little less problematic. Okay, it's still got skew. This is still uh, not that great. <laughs> and it does change our results just a little bit. Okay. And so this would be a quick way to test it with and without outliers. Okay. But if you change the argument and say the false it does this two strikes throughout rule. All right, so back to the notes over here. So that's how we can get and use the full data and basically get this outlier stuff that we did last week. I can see the correlation table. Hey, remember, ignore the intercept. I mean, it looks pretty good here, right? Um, basically, previous and Facebook are only correlated at 0.14, that's okay. I can look at my linearity plot, my normality plot, and my homogeneity plot uh, separately. So I can print them out. They do automatically print when you run the function because I can't control that. <laughs> but they also are saved so you can print them later if you want. Now, it does uh, run each stage in the mediation. So I could just print those models out, run summary of my mediation results, dollar sign model one, because everything is saved in a list. If you're ever confused about how that kind of works, you can come over here and look at my environment okay, and say, you know what? Show me med results. Okay. And so I can see all the options that I have possible. The nice thing is, let's come over here. You can hit this little button here and it'll send it to the console. And so you can see what it's saving in each one. You can also do the drop down. I just think it's a little easier to read, but like data screening here is actually a list of all the pictures. And then this here is a list for the plots, but it will print the picture for you. Okay. And that picture is made using the diagram library because it's not really meant for ggplot. Okay. So these models are all gonna be the same. I just wanna show you how to print them. Okay. Now, the other things that we can grab are the Sobel test. So I can print out my indirect effect, um, the, so this here is the, is the actual score that you might report, the indirect effect, which is A times B, 
or C minus C prime, <laughs> they're the same. Okay, so we went from 0.32 to 0.26. So mathematically that works out to 0.0558. You can see so bell like we just calculated. And now the bootstrapping part. So the bootstrapping will show you this exact same effect here. It should, or you've done something wrong. This is how I normally figure out that I've typed something incorrectly. It will run a thousand bootstraps, which is not too unusual. You will have to tell it to run more bootstraps if you have more data. So if you have like 10,000 rows, you have to, it won't let you run less bootstraps than there are rows. And so our indirect effect will be reported as 0.06 if I round up with a 95% confidence interval, which we can get here by doing boot CI. And that prints us out the normal confidence interval. So negative 0.01 to 0.12. Now that includes zero. So it matches our Sobel test. We would not find mediation here. And then our Q diagram. All right, so that all together is mediation. And, you know, we're about to, in the next video, gonna cover uh, a slightly different form of fancy regression. So keeping your keep in mind that mediation is much like the lawyer term, right? There's a third party involved and we're interested if that third party or that third variable changes some sort of relationship. Okay. When we get to moderation in the next video, we're gonna talk about interactions, which is a very different effect. So people often get these two things confused. So if you can just remember mediation is about the third wheel, the moderation is the other thing, you'll be all right. Okay. So see you over in the next video for moderation.